My name is Janine Gibson. Um, I uh, joined the Financial Times three weeks ago. Um, so please be very kind in your feedback because I'm still on probation. Uh, you might, there are some people here I know from my previous jobs. I used to be at The Guardian and at BuzzFeed, although most of my former bosses were in the sessions entitled Bloodbath earlier. Um, so shout out to them. Anyway, uh, uh, Radhika Jones, I am uh, extremely uh, proud to introduce to you. She is the uh, fifth editor-in-chief of Vanity Fair since its revival in 1983. Previously, her senior editorial roles included uh, New York Times, Time Magazine, the Paris Review, and she started, probably most interestingly, as um, arts editor of the Moscow Times. Um, she might be the only editor-in-chief with a PhD who uh, has to endure two paragraphs of discussion of her sartorial choices in every profile. And as you can see, we have dressed today so you can make out who's good and who's evil. Uh, please welcome Radhika to the stage. I think we're both good. We're both good. Thank you for saying that. I'll give it 20 minutes. Hi. Um, uh, when we spoke yesterday briefly about this interview, I said to Rudy, is there anything that you really don't want to talk about? And she said, well, you know, if I'm absolutely honest, I'm a little fed up with every interview, starting with the legacy of Graydon Carter and being defined by this man who had this job before me. So, Graydon Carter. <laughs> it's, a, it's a year on since you took over and, and, and dealing with his 25-year legacy. Um, reportedly by cutting the budget of the magazine by up to $14 million. Uh, how's that been? <laughs> by the way, um, uh, people ask, they do, they ask me, what's it like to fill Graydon Carter's shoes? And I say, he's still filling his shoes. Um, and, I'm, and I have no doubt they're beautiful shoes and I, f I fill my own shoes. Um, it's, it, you know, Vanity Fair is always about the, capturing the spirit of the moment. And I have found that now that my tenure is about a year and a half old, a lot of that feels like it's in the rear view mirror. I mean, Graydon's legacy is hugely important to what we do every day, and we think about it all the time. And I think a lot about Tina Brown's legacy, too. She's the person who really um, uh, took, she took over Vanity Fair in the 80s, and she, um, and she kind of put this stamp on it. It was very edgy, it was very raw. When I got the job, I requested from the Condé Nast librarian, which is like, the, gotta be the best job, um, archive bound copies from both of their tenures, particularly at the beginnings of their tenures, because that's what I was entering into and it's important. And what I found was that, um, you know, they both took a lot of risk, they tried different things out, and, and much of what they did still remains in the core proposition of Vanity Fair. For, for Tina, it was about defining that new creative and political class and doing it with edge and energy. And Graydon added a kind of top note of nostalgia and old Hollywood glamour. And so I've been able to draw on both of those things, which is a great gift and something I, I do feel grateful for. Um, and, and the job is about taking those codes and, and imparting your own sensibility. And that's kind of the journey. So, mm -hmm. um, so I'm feeling very forward looking at the moment. But coming in, I mean, you did have to take a huge amount out of the budget. I was, yes, I was tasked with modernizing the enterprise, and we've all been there. Anyone in the media knows what that's like. It's been our story since at least 2008. I mean, you know, and you can, look, you can get into a vortex of depression if you listen too long to people talk about how big the expense accounts were back in the 80s and how the bar cart came around and, you know. But, Do you not have a bar cart? I mean, here's the thing. You can actually get a bar cart. It's like, it's a thing you can do. I've done this actually twice now at two different um, places of work. You hire a bartender and you get a cart and you put liquor on the cart and they come around. This is a good tip for staff morale. We have, um, I offer we have it to you freely. Um, no, I mean, f for sure it's hard. What I will say is that you come away with a team that is, that is tightly knit we are way more integrated now, not just print and digital, which feels like a buzzword, let's integrate our print and digital teams, but with our events and our video and our podcasting efforts, you know, we have a mission that's very clear. And when you have to put focus on financials like that, 
it forces you to do two very valuable things. First, you have to think about different revenue streams, because obviously the goal is not to keep cutting until eternity. The goal is to diversify your revenue and start to energize things in different ways. And the other thing is that you prioritize and make choices that are right for the brand with the resources that you have. And we are still very resource rich. I was very glad we launched our Star Wars cover in May um, and uh, we got a nice shout out from Ad Age. They said, oh, kudos to Vanity Fair for still sending Annie Leibovitz, on, Annie Leibovitz on these big budget shoots. She went to Jordan and shot on location. And this is something that Vanity Fair has traditionally done. And it's something that's really important to us. And so we make the decision to invest in that. And if we want to send a reporter to China to investigate what happened to Fan Bingbing, the, the huge Chinese movie star when she disappeared, we do that. Mm -hmm. So it's really about making choices that are right for the brand, you know, in an environment that admittedly is, is challenging, but again, is something that I think all of us in this um, ecosystem understand. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm making jokes, but that's slightly because at the inkier end of the media, we are so envious of the glossy magazines. And we just, <laughs> like, we're like peeking through your neck curtains going, what must it be like to live in such luxury? I, um, but I interviewed Graydon Carter many years ago and asked him what the most amount of money he had spent spiking a story was. And unfortunately, he answered this off the record, so I absolutely can't tell you it began with a two. Um, I assume those days are long gone. We try not to over-assign. I mean, we try to think through, really, like, what are we investing in if we send a reporter out to start looking into this story? And where will it fit in our lineup? And where does it fit, and this is a, a bigger picture thing, but where does it fit in the kind of arc of the narrative that, that we are telling culturally overall? Um, and what, you know, what, is, what will be the payoff if we sink a lot of money into this particular photo shoot and not mm. this one? So we have those conversations. Um, and you know, it's something that I'm proud of because I feel like what it means is that when we commit to a story or to a shoot or to a video or whatever it is, like we have thought it through. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I think that's responsible. Right, it's not good for the soul to be spiking things for a quarter of a million dollars. Um, in your, in theory, uh, oh, I should say by the point, um, uh, please do go on the slido.com thing and um, using the hashtag FT News, submit your questions because we have almost no time. I will continue to ask questions like this. So if you really want to ask for an invitation to the Oscar party, um, please use that and make a good joke as well. Um, in your inaugural editor's letter, you talked about the climate you were taking on Vanity Fair in. It, was, uh, it couldn't have been a more symbolic moment of change. There was Harvey Weinstein, women shaping and telling their own stories. Um, and you did refer to Tina. In a sense, you're coming after two proud, proudly excessive editors who embraced their excess and their ability to sort of storm around New York. It, it made me, th um, looking back on it, it made me realize how hard it must be to actually shape a vision out of, out of cuts. How, how how you, do you start with what you can't do or do you start with this is where I want to be? It must almost be easier to start from scratch. You, you just really, you think about what you have. You just really think forward. Because so what were the sacred cows that you thought I must keep this and this? Well, working with Annie for mm. one thing. Um, and, and because Annie is an artist and she is a visionary and she has been part of the, the legacy of Vanity Fair since, since Tina edited. Mm. So, she was very important to me. That's just one example. Um, but it's also the type of story that we do, the mix of story. And so what that means is that you need editors around you who have expertise in many different things, in finance, in Hollywood, in um, Silicon Valley. And so you know, it was important to me to make sure that we had the footprint in all of those places that we needed. And how, do you, how does your style editing the magazine sort of uh, do you think show in the, ma in the magazine itself and the content? Um, I, you know, I came through the business really as a hands-on editor and I, th I think, I hope that shows in the way the magazine reads. Um, I, I want each story, we all want each story to be, um, you know, robust and engaging and interesting which is very important for Vanity Fair and maybe one of the things that distinguishes us. We're not 
simply there to provide information, which is maybe more of a strict news function. We are often people's guilty pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, we are there to give them a little excess. We are there um, to chronicle people when they're on the way up, but also when they're on the way down, um, and exercise a little schadenfreude, perhaps, and have fun. Mm -hmm. So I feel like all of those things are part of the way that I approach the magazine, and it's part of the reason that, if I can, I like to go on photo shoots. And you know, um, when we photographed Michael B. Jordan last summer in the Hamptons for our November cover, at the end of the day, Cass Bird, who was shooting him, convinced him to wade into water up to his neck. Um, and that ended up being the cover. He's like, in, well, he, I guess he's up to here. But he had gone in up to his neck, which was very impressive. Um, we had not negotiated that in advance. It was a beautiful day. And anyway, at the end, um, Cass said, oh, let's get a picture of you two together. And Michael was in the water. So I was like, OK. So I rolled up my pants and went in. Because I figure if you're going to be the editor of Vanity Fair, you should just go for it, have fun. That is not um, a terrible and, day and, ha and just have those moments. So that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. I'm slightly, yeah. <laughs> for clown. Yeah. No, it was a happy moment. I completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, what, uh, I genuinely have lost my train of thought. Um, Michael B. Jordan does that to people. That's, <laughs> that's why he was on our cover. You painted a vivid picture. Um, so when you're thinking about um, what, what to put on the cover and what your cover, stand, cover, how, what your covers say about your magazine, you are, it has seemed to me, much more celebratory and you are trying to reflect a different sort of culture that is... Um, uh, that, that's trying to spotlight things that you want to celebrate rather than tear stuff down. Um, does, how do you square that with the schadenfreude tone that you're talking about? Um, it's a good question. It's kind of all in there. I think for us, it really is about the mix. Um, certainly for covers, I think we have a function to really define and anoint a creative class. And I think one of the things that's most interesting to me about doing this job right now is that there is so much new talent in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. It is remarkable. Um, it's remarkable to me. A lot of the people I put on the cover last year hadn't been on the cover before, mm -hmm. um, but they are genuine stars and they deserve it. And so it feels to me like that's worthwhile because it does end up collectively making a statement about where we, where we are artistically, creatively. Um, you know, one of the things that interests me um, that I think about for the future is that we also live in an era where the where you know so many so much of our on-screen talent is also behind the scenes talent. People are becoming creators, producers. We had Nicole Kidman on our May cover. She's a classic Vanity Fair subject. She's, it was her tenth cover, but this was the first time she was on the cover for a role in a television show. Mm which actually I asked her about when I interviewed her at the wing a couple weeks ago, and she said her career in Australia had, actually had started in television and she had come full circle. It's a tremendous role, and it tells you, what it tells you about our culture right now is that we do live in an era where television and the movies have, you know, now are on an equal plane, which just wasn't the case 20 years ago. She's also now a producer, and she wears that hat, and she wears it very actively. And so it's interesting to me, even the faces who are familiar in the culture, they have taken on different roles, and, and they symbolize different things. Mm. And, um, and, and that is something that I think we do want to not just celebrate, but draw attention to. But what I'm, I, I suppose what I'm trying to get to is if, you're, if you are positioning yourself as a celebrator of, of diverse cultures, mm -hmm. then how, how do you also kind of s slip the knife through the ribs in the, in the classic Vanity Fair way? Trade secrets, Janine. <laughs> Um, you don't see them coming. No, <laughs> it's true. You know, it's something that has been a part of the magazine's history, that tension, since it began. Because I think you could argue that Vanity Fair um, has both charted the celebrity industrial complex and also helped create it. Um, and so we try to, you know, we, ultimately we try to be rigorous in our storytelling. And that's really how I square it. I mean, I, I you know, I... We, we love to celebrate fantastic talent, but at the end of the day, we are journalists and we are on the side of the story. Um, and we will do what's needed to make that story newsy and right. What is the, is the cover still the thing in, in the sense that I, in my head and, and 20 years ago, somebody came in and said something about the newsstand sales and that was it. Everybody sort of died or fell on that. And presumably now you're working in a world of as many different metrics as we do in news or anything else. Right. Do you, how do you, um, what's the one you obsess over? How do you balance your sort of 
magazine cover sales with your Instagram followers or your, I don't know, page views? Yes, it's like a big soup. We, I talk a lot about covers partly because they're almost, they're like a calling card, it's shorthand. Um, but also it's because even though there are physically fewer newsstands around, and so that is a much less important metric to us, um, your cover is the thing that, that lives on Instagram where we have added a million followers in the past 12 months. Like it's, it still travels, it travels more than it used to. So, and it does represent you know, who you're trying to be in the world. So, um, so for that reason, we think a lot about those choices. But in terms of metrics, we really are focused now on engagement. And um, back to the Star Wars cover, the story that we ran with those images, um, now I have to remember my math, hang on a sec. The number of minutes people spent reading that story was equivalent to watching The Last Jedi more than 13,000 times. So people are reading, which is great. And we look at engagement. We want to see how long people are spending with our content. Mm. And, and in a way, it, I mean, it's such a gift. Like, people didn't have those tools. When all you had was newsstand, all you knew was that somebody picked up the magazine. You didn't know what they read. You didn't know if they read it at all. Maybe six of their friends read it. You, you had no idea. You couldn't trace that engagement. And now, obviously, with our um, online uh, presence and metrics, we can have a better understanding of what our readers are doing and what they come back for, what prompts them to subscribe, all of those things, which is very valuable and, you know, and it helps us be strategic. In a world where um, you can go viral because your picture editor has been conned by a would-be socialite um, and writes a fa fabulous feature about it, uh, um, uh, how do you sort of, you know, would you rather have that than an Annie Leibovitz cover, which, which says more about a, a 2019 Vanity Fair? Well, we get to have both, so I don't have to answer that question. <laughs> no, really, you know what we, I'm saying. It is. It's just two it is. Different audiences. Um, it, it, it is, but you know, I I do I count on having both. I mean, we we really we think about the mix all the time because it's the it's those things together. And speaking that that story was about yes, our photo editor had been conned by um, Anna Delvey, the um, the fake New York heiress, and she wrote about it in the first person. And when I think about the way we arted that story, we actually used her own pictures from this vacation they had taken together, and she got stuck with the bill. Um, and so those were, you know, those were just snapshots from the vacation. Very, but it's a different kind of story, and it merits a different kind of treatment. And I think our readers give us the permission to play in both of those spaces. Mm. Um, I will come to questions in a minute, so please submit them or, or be thinking if you want to stick your hands in the air. Um, but I, first, I want to ask you in this world of disaggregation where a story can go viral or a cover is uh, uh, seen on Instagram, how you hold together the voice of a general interest magazine, which may have been personified by excessive editors, but, mm -hmm. uh, but it has got to somehow equal more than the sum of its parts as a whole, right. but people aren't necessarily reading it that way. Right. I think it has to do with, well, what I will say first is that we are finding success, we've always found success in this, but it's, in, it's increasing success that we see with our metrics where under the umbrella of all of the things that Vanity Fair does, we really do have permission from our readers to d dive deep into certain areas. So um, for some of our readers, it's our royals coverage. People love to read about the royal family and we are one of the few outlets in America who really pursues that story, um, which has gotten ever more um, enticing because there's now an American uh, duchess in the mix. And we saw it with our Game of Thrones coverage. We had fantastic kind of fanatical Game of Thrones coverage. We're able to tap into people's um, very immersive interests. And in a funny way, I feel like that is the common denominator, um, is, is the curiosity and open-mindedness of our reader um, and how we are able to find stories that, um, that are uh, either very powerful na narratives that take them, that introduce them to people, personalities who are powerful um, and who are going through unique circumstances. And I think about some of our finance stories in that way. Um, it's the personalities who bring a Vanity Fair story to life. That's always been the case. 
Um, and within that kind of general structure, we're able to go into the royals' personalities and you know, the true story behind this episode of The Crown and um, you know, what the creators of Game of Thrones thought about it, the way everyone thought about their last episode and all of those things. It's the personality of it that unites it. It sounds more like um, casting than, than pacing in the sense of reading a magazine and thinking, well, I must have this light and this shade and this funny and this drama. It's both of those things. We think a lot about certain keywords. One of them is personality. One of them is wit. Um, one of them is, is cinema, which I mean sort of in the, the way that things look. Is it cinematic? Does it have drama? Um, one of them is party, because that's another thing that we're known for. Um, and so we want that party spirit. So yeah, I think that's true. All right, so what was it like doing your first Oscars party? Um, it, was, uh, it was really great. Uh, I, was, I had been in the job for about two months, and so most of the party planning was underway. Um, and I'm just thinking back, I mean, it was such a blur. But, uh, what did you wear? So I wore pro a Prabal Gurung dress that was so beautiful, and I, I did truly feel like a movie star. Um, and that was wonderful. And, and uh, the, so the thing that sticks with me, <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm remembering it, um, is that so I hosted, I hosted dinner before the Oscar party for people who want to watch the Oscars and come to the party, but, um, but want to watch them sort of collectively. So it's, a, it's, it's super fun to do that. And so, but it means it's a long night because you know, you're on Pacific time, so the dinner starts at like 4.30 or something. Um, and I was wearing this dress that was corseted and very slim, and I was wearing high heels, and it's all good, but it's like a nine hour night. So when I got to like hour five or six, um, I thought, wow, I would really like to sit down. And um, I noticed that all the furniture was like lounge furniture, which it's very hard when you're tall and you're wearing heels and you have a dress that's like this. To, it's like you, you're sort of, you know. Um, so, uh, so the one note that I gave to our um, absolutely magical events person um, after when we had our post-mortem on the Oscar party was, could we get some bar stools next year? Because then I could just perch on a bar stool and I'm sure, and so we did that this year. And um, I, I, I used the bar stool and a lot of other women did too. So that was my contribution to structural inequality. Um, it is not, see, it's not Greg and Carter's legacy because you're doing it backwards and in heels, literally. I guess so, yes. <laughs> Forward looking, I hope. So. Yeah. Um, uh, I want to ask one question about Condé Nast, and then uh, I will go to the floor. I realize that you don't run Condé Nast. Um, however, there's a sell-off happening. The company is losing hundreds of millions of dollars by public reports, and uh, uh, Golf Digest, W, Brides, these, these titles all went. Um, do you feel like the, um, well, two questions, really. Do you feel like you, New Yorker and Vogue are, exist in a different tier from, from the rest of the, of the building? Do you th does the rest of the building feel like that? And, um, and, and does that sort of sense of this great big conglomerate cannot hold, in, in, in again, a specialist, disaggregated world, does that permeate into the titles themselves? I mean, it's not something that occupies my mind a whole lot just because there are so many pressing things to do. Um, one thing I will say is that we have a brand new CEO. He just started about four weeks ago. So there's a lot of transition happening, obviously, within the entire organization. And, and I've met with him one-on-one. -on -one. We've all had town halls with him. He's very direct and straightforward. And he seems very aware of our strengths as brands. Um, and you know, like, like any magazine family, um, we are, it's a, it's a it's a collection that's full of individual brand strengths um, and then a kind of collective footprint. And so there's always that balance and that tension. But I think for us, it's very much a, a moment of, of transition. We have a new CEO. I'm sure he's going to bring his leadership style to whatever comes next. And I, and I think, you know, as I said earlier, one thing that we, I know we all think a lot about is this question of diversifying our revenue streams so that um, what people think of you know, what used to be just a magazine company very associated with print magazines is, is not that anymore. Right, some questions. Um, you spoke about Tina's Vanity Fair and Grayson's Vanity Fair. Can you describe Radhika's Vanity Fair? I mean, to be fair, it was me really talking about the other two. But um, uh, I feel like we've discussed this. But can you quickly sum up your, your, sure. your Vanity Fair? So um, my Vanity Fair, I think, is about uh, chronicling and 
anointing and exploring this new creative class that really has come about in the last couple of years because of things like the Weinstein reporting, because of the ways that social media has changed all of our senses of celebrity and notoriety and fame. Um, you know, in a, in a way, if Vanity Fair was, was always a celebrity magazine, we have to contend with the fact that celebrity looks very different now. Like, think about when Tina took over, Ronald Reagan was in the White House. And, and if you remember, and she wrote about this in her diaries, you know, uh, I mean, there was a lot of consternation about that because he was a Hollywood movie star. Well, now we have a re reality TV star in the White House. And so things are kind of very different, but also a little bit the same. And so I, I try to find those common threads and update them. Um, I talked a little bit about what Graydon did so masterfully with nostalgia. My nostalgia is updated. It's really more about the 80s and the 90s, and it's partly because those are my eras when I grew up, but it's also because there's something happening in the culture that's very powerful and provocative about those periods of time where all of a sudden the generations below me are coming up and it's like they don't, they didn't watch the O.J. Simpson trial in real time. They're watching documentaries and limited series about it. Everyone's talking about Chernobyl. You know, I remember that as a 13 year old, but there are a lot of people I work with even who don't have those memories, don't have that collective knowledge. And I feel like our moment in culture right now is linking back to those times and finding, and, and finding that arc, that thread. And that's something that I'm really interested in, this kind of the blind spot of, rec of the recent past and kind of bringing that to bear on our storytelling and figuring out how we got from there to here. Um, so that was a long answer. But. No, it's a rich scene. Um, this feels like a slightly tricksy question. How would you describe the job of cultural arbiter to someone with no awareness of what you do? I mean, none of our jobs make sense to anyone who doesn't. <laughs> I try to explain this to my parents regularly. Um, <laughs> they're very supportive, but I think they, they kind of, mm. they don't really. Anyway. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, the, the culture is in oversaturation mode. It's, um, it's in overflow mode. There are subsets of fame that probably many of us in this room don't even really encounter. Um, I'm talking about, you know, YouTube stars. I remember the first time I was editing a story and the phrase YouTube star, this was years ago, but um, the phrase YouTube star came up and I literally was like, well, what does that even mean? Like, what does this, per what is this person a star of? Or what is their talent? What is their thing? Now it's like in the lexicon, it's just something we take for granted. But, but I think that, you know, you do accrue when you've worked in the business for a long time an, a, an instinct and an expertise in terms of the people who rise up out of that big sea of talent and have a particular kind of charisma, or they have the right story for that moment, or they have a mix of um, talents that makes them unique in the culture. And that's how I felt about Lena Waithe, who was my first cover choice, was that here was someone who was, who was bubbling up in the culture, you know, a little bit on the edges, but, but who has tremendous potential and who plays a very unique role in terms of her ability to write, act, um, produce, create a pipeline for new talent, all of those things. So, so I think it, what it is is a, a person who makes sense um, and is able to curate uh, a culture that is, really over, that is really overflowing. Well, it's a great gig. Thank you very much, Radhika. Thank, um, thank, thank you for joining us in our warm bath of Gloucester magazines. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on. Well done.